Okay, uh, everybody see in the opening screen well? Yes. Okay. Um, we put this together um, primarily as sort of a welcome back, um, fill people in on some of the changes in evolution. Um, there's nothing like a major construction site 18 months into a pandemic and changing a significant portion of the staff to create opportunities to rejigger things a bit. And so we wanted to share some of some of the physical changes, but more importantly, some of the um, evolving focal areas for the program that have become available to us. Um, so we call it Litzinger Renewed um, and leaving plenty of time for open discussion um, uh, that I called Ask the Director Almost Anything. Um, so hope this is a valuable time for you. Uh, I'm getting a message to bring my shared window to the front, which is that I, kids now, good? It, it looks fine for us, Bob. Okay, that, I'm just getting a very cryptic message from Zoom, but I'll just ignore it. Um, it you know, most important, I'm going back up a bit. Oh, come on. Zoom gaffs. Um, so, um, you know, older picture here, Molly and Adashola, um, but just getting back to our work, getting kids engaged with nature and with the community. Um, and as you're becoming aware, yes, we are live, we're back. Um, these were kids Tuesday afternoon um, that we had. Um, it's gonna be a slow fall, but um, we do have more bookings in September and October than we had all of last school year. So you know, that's a, a mark of some resilience. Our expectation is that the fall is gonna be slow, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, schools, our sense is that schools are getting kids back in the building, wanting to see where things are, be sure that the sky doesn't fall. And as things get more comfortable for them, we'll have an uptick in the school visits, which is why it's so great to have you all coming back and um, getting back to the important work that we're doing. And volunteers, obviously there's Ellen with a group of kids. Um, you can see masks are still a bit of a work in progress. I love the elbow mask the girl has in the center there. Um, that is one elbow that is not gonna get COVID. Hey, Bob, your, yep. your pictures are not changing. We're still on the title screen. Ah, that is what. So bring your shared application forward. That's what I was asking about before. Uh, let, me try, let me undo the share here and redo. And share screen, PowerPoint, share. It's hiding, it's, it's not showing it correctly. Apologies for that. Uh, let me try, let me try a different share here. Stop share again. Zoom, I love you. Share screen, I'm just gonna share the desktop. So whatever's on my desktop is what you see. Uh, we, we good with that opening slide with Molly and Edishola now? Yes, we're seeing the title screen again. Okay, and the uh, kids from Tuesday? Yep, we now see that. Ha, we're in business. Um, so as, as I was saying, uh, you know, great that we have schools coming back. A lot of them are still cautious, seeing that they're going to even be basic school days are doing okay, but um, we're getting there. And as I said, uh, more schools in September and October than we had all of last school year, a uh, mix of public and private. Uh, so we're coming back and it's good to have you back on this journey with us as well. Um, another shot from Tuesday with Ellen teacher and some kids. Uh, so saying masks are still a work in progress there with the elbow mask doing a fine job of protecting the girl's elbow. Um, but with that, also uh, the Horton Restoration teams at work, uh, facetiously helping with the laundry there. In fact, um, 
major stream cleanup from back in the summer. Um, and again, just so important to have you back. Um, we don't do what we do without you. Um, and we wanna uh, welcome you back, acknowledge your commitment and loyalty, um, staying with us through all of this. Um, so first of many thank yous and honors for you and your commitment. Um, those of you who have been back on the grounds, you've seen a number of improvements we've been able to do during the low. Um, that path of death with all of the bricks all over the place leading into the glass house uh, totally resurfaced and um, ready to go now, very smooth, easy to walk on. Um, some nice stone entries into the uh, breezeway. Uh, so just a, a much nicer appearance there and more functional space coming and going from the glass house. Um, a um, take your pick um, maintenance shed, maintenance facility, um, four rounds with the city council, two with the architectural review board, two others with the planning and zoning. Um, so eight meetings later, we do in fact have a shed uh, moving right along. Uh, next steps on this will be getting the garage doors in later this month and then um, loading up the interior with workspaces, work areas and such. Um, so that'll really help. Um, most of you uh, stand on the list as primarily education volunteers that haven't had the adventures of fishing things out of our current really undersized shed, but I think this is really gonna be helpful for getting the, really, the important grounds work moving forward. Um, bonus for you all, um, Ross, the kid who's kneeling in red there, uh, he was a participant in a camp we did several years ago. Um, he put up the studs and the roofing trusses for the shed. Um, obviously a bit older now, but uh, just an interesting little trivia connection there. Um, a former camper is now uh, helping to build our shed, um, or did during the summer. And Steve the cat has come to join us. Good morning, Steve. Another improvement um, more directly tied to the education programs. Uh, Jane's brother created these incredible cabinets for us. Uh, a year ago in August, the, we had a small flood in the uh, cabin, tr totally trashed the floor. We did, redid the floors and then just kind of kept on going with Im building improvements. Uh, if you remember the older shelving in there. We just tore all that out to give it a much more natural look. Um, and James' brother just did this incredible job creating these uh, natural wood cabinets for us. Um, when you get there, you'll, you'll see they're, they're actually commercial cabinets underneath, but just a really nice uh, surface on them, and nice uh, coverings and finishes on them. Um, so we hope that's a much more usable space for you. Um, New roof, um, it was not nice to be able to get that done while we were pretty slow on school groups where we could really make a mess for a while without interfering with programs. And it's kind of on the fence, but once they tore off the old roof and it was kind of an OMG sort of moment of, yeah, we needed that roof. Um, so that should keep us going for quite a while now. All good there. And that was kind of where we left it. But then yesterday, oops, on one more. Um, when we get back to having in-person enrichments and programs, uh, totally new AV system so that we can get away from the projector that doesn't quite line up with the screen and the kludgy speakers, uh, really nice system. Now we just need to um, get back to doing in-person enrichments and education programs, but we think you're really gonna like that. And that was kind of where we left it, but then yesterday was demo day. Um, we're redoing the barn classroom. And so that's where we may well lose um, Julie, Leslie, and Martha if the power cuts off on them. Um, but over the next month or so, this room is going to be totally demoed and redone. Um, they tore out the shelving and the pop-up tables yesterday. Um, new, higher quality pop-up tables going in. None of those shelves really just became accumulators. Um, the back cabinet you're seeing there, that'll come out and a new lower cabinet will be in there and the walls will be um, 
greatly improved, let's put it that way. Our current intention is to get some enlargements of the Rich Blosser photographs and create a much more natural appearance there and a more curated look for the kids. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, all good there. Uh, so that's kind of the uh, facility update, but all of that is just a means of enabling uh, the programs and the work that we do. And so I uh, transition at this point toward looking at programs, but before we do that, any questions specific to building and grounds improvements or changes? There's plenty of time afterwards, we just wanted to not to lose things in the in the flow if, if people had questions now. Do you have any idea when the volunteers might be allowed on site? Uh, the well, the Hort volunteers are fully back. The Ed volunteers are in process. Um, Leslie, what's it? They need to do what? The two pieces. The um, the the one that Scott's leading of general safety, and then the. Um, Re reorientation to the site and site-specific safety pieces? Right. That's, cor that's correct. There's a, I think we have the last Scott uh, orientation scheduled for this afternoon at one o'clock. Right. And then a site uh, orientation tomorrow that is full, but we do have spots available for the Monday morning site orientation from nine to noon. Yep, it's a yeah. two-part mm -hmm. thing. And based on demand and such, we'll, we'll create more. We want you back. We just um, we have some hoops that um, we're required to have volunteers go through. And um, the port volunteers did similar ones. The education process is just a little more involved because you have the direct face-to-face -face work with others, including the um, masked kids. Um, but we did have volunteers work with the kids on Tuesday and gradually Oh. Uh, bringing people back. Um, so good. Uh, other things about building and grounds before we jump into program? Looks beautiful. The cabin is incredible. Yeah, I think it 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 makes a nice feel. I think it, it's um, you know was is the Rama manual thing never never let a um, what was his term you know never never let a crisis go to waste. Um, <laughs> And so uh, it gave us the opportunity, both the um, lull in programs let us really tear things up without interfering, you know, redoing that roof while we had full, full loads of school programs would have been a real operational and safety challenge. And so it gave us a chance to really make a mess, get things done. Um, and practically speaking, um, the staff positions that we didn't fill for a while and not paying for buses, uh, freed up some money to do some of this work. Um, so I, I think you, as, as you settle back in, uh, we hope you'll be pleased with it, but um, we'll also look to you for some suggestions and ideas about how to make those last tweaks to make it really work for you uh, in your work. Okay, um, so again, all of this infrastructure is pointless if it doesn't enable us to do better work. And so I uh, just wanted to share some thoughts on where we are, where we, some of the areas we'll be focusing on program wise. Um, this is not one of our kids, this is stock photography. Um, apparently his, his name is Ozzy, lives in Southwest England, but it works for a picture. I just like the idea of a kid surveying their domain and making plans from it. Um, if you've done other workshops with me lately, um, yeah, I use this picture as kind of iconic of the work that we do. Um, standard suburban kid, literally wrapped in corporate media properties, but for a minute we grabbed his attention, got him focused on something really cool in nature. And it's an instance of this John Dewey quote around the, the worth of any institution, including Litzinger, including the garden as a whole, is this effect on enlarging and improving experience. In this case, we certainly did that for Dylan um, in enlarging his experience, getting him engaged with something that clearly has his attention from the natural world. Um, you also never know the impact you have, the fact that these kids come and go. But um, one of the things I remember about Dylan 
Um, apparently, I had used him in a simulation in a program I was leading. He was a salamander. I forget what it was, but you know, a year and a half later, he came up to me on a future visit and said, your salamander is swimming away. He was going off to another school. Um, but you just never know what these impacts you have on kids uh, in Dewey's language, enlarging and improving their experience. Um, so just a reminder of the importance of the work that we're doing. Um, with that uh, quick um, philosophy of ed tutorial, uh, experience more than just what we do to somebody, but um, in Dewey's language, it's what, what they do with the experience they have, how they reflect on it, how they grow from it, engage with better, with future experiences better, develop habits or ways of approaching experience with curiosity, uh, with persistence to, to puzzle something out. And ultimately we're building citizens, whether that's a five-year-old, a 12-year-old, um, those of us that are considerably beyond 12-year-olds that I'll put myself in for the moment, um, all of which wraps around this power of pooled and cooperative experience that um, makes us citizens. And that's part of what we're doing and part of what we're generating through our work is uh, improving the quality of citizenship in the community and picture that that ball coming together and makes good experience. So if with that as kind of the header of what we're after, um, as many of you know, the, the founding idea of Litzinger was environmental education for school students. Uh, but we're really wrapped around the idea that it, we do that better if we think more broadly. Um, Yes, we have a focus on students, but this total ecosystem of the people involved in Litzinger make it a much better community to be part of. Um, the you all as volunteers, our teacher partners, the researchers, the staff, the community partners, people from other organizations that contribute to what we're doing. Um, as a staff, we're really committed to the idea that because of this interplay of all of these different groups, we everybody is better off. Uh, if we just delivered education programs, thanks for coming, hope you had a good time and learned something, that's good for what it is. But by engaging with you as committed naturalists, people committed to their growth, um, you, we were pretty confident that you all stick around more and are more committed to Litzinger because of the connections that you have with the research that's happening on site, the conservation work that's happening. None of that would happen without our community partners. Um, and so just wanna keep in mind as we move forward, it's about the kids, but it's also about a whole lot more. And we wanna be sure that we're meeting our commitment to you that this is a positive space for you to be in as well, uh, and that a place you value. Um, and particularly with the 18 month low, um, we're impressed, overawed, we admire your commitment and we're deeply appreciative for that. Um, moving ahead a bit on programs, just an example of how all these pieces tie together. Um, Hannah was one of our summer interns. Um, instead of just doing internships as, oh, good, cheap summer labor, uh, we really work to use the internships as a career launch for people interested in restoration and conservation careers. But part of that, she did her research project on tracking turtles and um, some of the restoration staff can chime in if I'm going a bit off field here, but um, essentially tracking turtles on site but the long-term benefit of that, aside from the great experience that she had, is that we now have some really cool equipment to engage older kids with uh, so that they experience cutting edge science, not just learning about turtles, but actually having chances to do some of this work and use actual science tools in their work. Um, and it has turtles, which makes Leslie very happy. So there's always a bonus there. Um, but just one of many examples where you start crisscrossing across that diagram where um, each of the different parts of our human ecosystem feeds each other to make a positive experience at Litzinger. With all that, though, um, 
particularly those of you that have been volunteering for a while, you've noticed that our grade level distribution is skewing toward the younger kids quite a bit the last few years. And there's nothing, certainly nothing wrong with working with younger kids. It's essential work to be doing. Um, but we'd like to really focus on spreading the grades out a bit more than we've been able to for the last several years. Um, a lot of factors go into that. We can pick apart in the discussion if you'd like. Um, but working toward that, the Litzinger Foundation freed up some seed money for us to start working on some initiatives to better enable us to meet the needs that upper elementary and middle schools need to uh, make a Litzinger partnership work for them in the political realities that they're working in. Um, one piece of that, um, this is a model that Stacy Carmen developed with our friends at MIT. Um, we've had a number of National Science Foundation grants. This one in particular is a model that Stacy and Daniel Wendell, who's the lead programmer of this group at MIT, developed. Different plants, Ecology 101, different plants do better or worse in different conditions. And so by varying the rain amount, sunlight amount, any other parameters, some species do better, some don't do as well. Um, why do we see big blue stem? We don't see squirrel cacti. Um, you know, it's part of the uh, parameters that they have to live in. Um, this was stuff that we developed separately under a National Science Foundation grant for broader science education purposes. Um, but what we'll be doing this fall, uh, rolling out in the spring, is making similar models um, specific to extending a Litzinger experience. And I want to be clear on that. It's not about putting technology into the Litzinger experience on site. Um, and we really want to protect that as a uh, direct people to nature experience. But how do we extend those experiences with pre and post time at Litzinger um, opportunities? And so modeling like this uh, can do some of that. Um, a new version of this software lets you actually program it so that the ground has different characteristics as well, not just the uh, outside, out, not the right term, but essentially the um, like rain and rain and sunlight that come, come down onto the plants, but also the uh, substrate that they're growing in. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to working with MIT to develop modules specific to Litzinger, thinking of pairing these. So for example, um, some plants do better or worse, even at smaller scale, certain parts of Litzinger are more amenable or less amenable to them. Um, so pair a model like this with short videos of um, staff or volunteers talking about why, why does this plant only grow in this part of Litzinger kind of thing scale up a bit, why do you see big blue stem at Litzinger, but you don't see it in the saguaro cacti plants? Um, critter wise, um, why do we not see caribou wandering around? Again, it's these temperature precipitation things drive what can live somewhere, very important concepts. And so we're just looking at ways to extend the experience, deepen some of the academic space around it, um, so that it makes the Litzinger programs meet the needs of upper elementary and middle schools a bit better. Um, but again, just want to be clear, this isn't, is not bringing technology into the uh, direct Litzinger experience. Um, we really want to preserve the space that you create with these small groups of kids. Um, but it is an effort to supplement that with things that they'd be doing back at school pre and post, um, making connections between these ideas and their own school grounds and community, um, and very much a work in progress. So we'll be sharing it as we go and look forward to your feedback as well, if you care to put your head into it a bit. Um, another instance of that, um, aside from the work we'll be doing with MIT, um, we've also done a lot with uh, GIS, Geographic Information Systems, basically uh, high-tech mapping tools. The first job that I was hired for with Litzinger back in 98 was using GIS to extend kids' environmental experience. Um, but one instance of where we're thinking of that, um, we do a great job of getting kids in and adjacent to the creek. Here's a uh, older shot of kids doing the stream team protocols, looking for macroinvertebrates. Um, 
many of you have led kids on what we call the watershed walk from the, the hill up by the glass house, how the water flows down. Um, all really good, really important learning. The limit here though is that it's canned to Litzinger. They get back on the bus, they're gone. Uh, how can we support them when they go back to school? Um, where does the water from our school grounds go? Uh, there's all kinds of mapping tools now about where's, where's the water come from to get to us? Where does the water go when it leaves us? Um, so we want to, again, scaffold the kids' experience with better pre and post stuff that ties into um, the expectations and political realities that the older kids and their teachers need to attend to. Um, one fun possibility that we're speculating on, this is with a... Um, group of uh, business partners that focus on K-12, kindergarten, 12th grade education uh, using GIS. They partner with Esri, the uh, major GIS company. Anyways, one of the things we were speculating on, if you've seen the Powers of 10 movie, and if you haven't, you need to go see it this morning. It's just a quick video, uh, picture aerial photography of people lying on a park in Chicago and then pulling up, getting a broader view and a broader view and a broader view, a broader view and so on. Um, imagine doing that with a watershed. Um, since watersheds are kind of nested within watersheds, within watersheds, within watersheds, um, can we use these mapping tools to help kids appreciate that? So, you know, Litzinger obviously is part of the Deer Creek watershed. Um, but even at that, there's sub watersheds. You go across into Overbrook, there's, um, what is it, Two Mile Creek, um, but you pull up to River to Pear and so on. Um, can we use the mapping tools to help kids think more broadly about watersheds, um, build off of the outstanding experience that we create for them at Lipsinger and think more broadly? Um, Another cut with the mapping tools would be just ecosystems in general. We're kind of at the crossover of prairie and woodland, um, but the risk here is we get them on site and that's, that's nature to them. Um, but getting a broader view that when you go further away, nature changes. And how can they take their direct experience at Litzinger and use that as a springboard to see elsewhere? Um, so what's at Litzinger and what's in my school grounds happens because of certain temperature and precipitation, you shift those parameters, different things happen. Um, that's something that I did with my fourth graders the last year that I was teaching full time. Um, and so again, we're looking at how do we extend the Litzinger experience, uh, particularly for these older kids and their teachers. So again, happy to discuss and pick that apart. but. Um, Looking forward to some possibilities there. So, um, shifting to the volunteer space for a bit. Um, again, we, we, we're deeply appreciative of your commitment and your loyalty to us. Uh, it would have been easy to just bail, particularly with the 18 month lull there. Um, and your being here speaks volumes to your commitment. Um, so thank you for that. Um, David Brooks, New York Times columnist, a couple of years ago, wrote this book called The Second Mountain that kind of, I think, applies to many of you. What he's referring to is you reach that stage in life where you've built a career, you've raised a family, and you're looking for that. You know, where can I spend time, invest my attention and um, resources into um, what he calls the second mountain, that kind of post, if the first one is the career and raising a family sort of thing, what's next? Where, where do you uh, focus your effort? And he, and he calls it the second mountain. And for many of you um, in Brooks language, uh, Litzinger is one of your second mountains. Um, and we want to be sure that Litzinger continues to be a space that you find value in, that it's feeding your identity as a citizen, as an environmentally aware, environmentally committed person. Uh, those of you working with our education programs, you also have um, part of your commitment to being an educator. We wanna be sure that that's part of your attention. And part of we continue to um, feed that and help that to be true for you. And if it's not, then uh, please chime in, let us know how we can do better at that. Um, 
So again, you, you, we, we're, we don't look to you just for free labor. We want this to be the space where you grow as a person as well. Um, and David part two, different David. Um, David Hansen um, is the chair of the education and philosophy program at Teachers College at Columbia University. And he writes very eloquently about vocation, uh, particularly about teaching as a vocation, but uh, I would broaden that discussion, uh, vocation as a citizen, um, vocation as professionals, all of which David calls this inner urge to serve and practical intelligence to bring that feeling to life, uh, which I think captures an important piece of our work as staff. We wanna be sure that's true for you with your um, volunteer commitments. Uh, but also the work we do with teachers and with kids. And we're building this motivation to do good in the world, what uh, Hanson calls the urge to serve, uh, but also being sure that we're all nurturing this practical intelligence to actually make that happen. You know, all the good intentions in the world only go so far if you don't have the perspectives and capacities to make that difference happen. Um, and likewise, just a lot of technical training doesn't do you a lot of good if there's no commitment to do something with it for the good of the community and the broader world. Um, so um, we want to keep that idea of vocation front and center, vocation as a teacher, vocation as a citizen, um, vocation as a professional. Um, and again, we, we look forward to collaboration with you to be sure that that is true and that it remains true as we move forward. A lot of stuff covered today. I just want to close out with one more of those uh, nuggets to think about. We can open up the discussion. And that's wonder. Um, this is uh, Matt Wellman um, came out when he was in second grade. He's climbing out of that uh, tree that fell along that first main path. Um, the tree is rotted a bit. Max is now in high school. There's no way he would get through that log, both from his size and the decay of the log. Um, but catch, catch that moment, that look of wonder in his face, the adventure that he had climbing in and out of the log, which is one of those experiences that we create every day for kids. Um, and just want to end with that as another touch point about the important work that we're doing. Um, wonder in the sense of awe and uh, just taking in nature in all its beauty, um, and also wonder in, wonder what's going on there. How, how can I figure it out? How can I better understand it? Um, again, that urge to serve and the capacity to make a difference is important for our work and what we're doing with kids. And one more time, uh, thank you for joining us on this venture in whatever format you're doing that, um, helping us with the education programs, the horticulture and restoration work that enables this to happen. Um, the mentoring of our interns that you all do so well. So um, with that, I'll drop out of the slides and stop the sharing and we can chat. Questions, thoughts, disagreements, uh, virtual vegetables to throw. Okay, Bob, I have a question. This Shoot. is Ann. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about that MIT model yeah. Uh, the, about the plant growth. Is that something that, that um, you're planning on learning more about in order to share with teachers? I didn't quite understand yeah, how that so, fits um, into Litzinger. Yeah, a little, little bit of back history there. Um, up until about three years ago, my role was split as part-time director and part-time I had to go find funding to finish out my paycheck kind of thing. And so we've had a partnership with MIT since 2006. We had a number of NSF grants. Uh, developing models like that. Um, the intention here is to bring all of that work that we're doing kind of on separate tracks into Litzinger. Again, not the direct on the ground experience you've been leading. And that's always a real mismatch because it really disrupts the quality of experience you have on the grounds. But pull back a level. Those teach, we, we see the kids on site a couple times a year, two or three times a year they see the kids 170, 180 days a year. How do we scaffold better experience at Litzinger because they have things like these modeling tools, the MIT pieces, the computer mapping tools. And so we, the intention here would be 
that we're doing teacher workshops so that they can use those pre and post visit to extend the quality of the experience at Litzinger. Um, and when they're um, adjusted fit the way we, we, we feel good about them, it will certainly create experiences for you to learn if you're interested, but um, it is meant to be in a school-based extension, again, not intruding on the direct experience you have with the kids on site. Okay, great. Thank you. Now I understand it a little bit more how it yeah, and it, it, it's a concept sketch at this point. What we're, what we're wrestling with is uh, if you made a histogram of the grades we serve, um, it tends toward preschool, first, second. We, we certainly do have third, fourth, and fifth, but less than we have for the younger kids. And so we're just trying to essentially stretch that out a bit, um, find ways to engage the older kids. Um, Part of it, they're dealing with a different reality. The public schools with testing, more academic expectations. Um, and we can make a good counter argument to that, but the teachers have realities they have to deal with too. Um, and so we're trying that out. Um, so we're looking ahead to, uh, we're gonna be doing some development this fall with our partners at MIT and with GIS ETC, the GIS company. Um, do some pilot testing this spring with some partner schools. Um, I'm probably gonna be doing some testing myself with some kids through Gifted Resource Council. They run a Saturday learning lab, um, had some discussions with their new executive director about doing some direct kid testing in that format. Teacher workshops this summer, maybe a kid camp this summer. Um, and, and we'll see where we are at that point. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Shoot. Do you see? Oh, can I go ahead? Yep, yep, go ahead. Oh, is there, do you foresee any expansion of the volunteer role at the schools in terms um, of helping to support what's yeah. happening at the school? Yeah, it's or? always been a possibility. We don't get a lot of requests on that. Um, you know, and certainly we can reopen that idea. Right now, um, access to school, last year access to schools just was not gonna happen, period. Um, even now it's a little bit iffy, um, they're, you know, quite variable. Um, I don't know, Leslie, Julie, have you had any invites to schools yet? We have not had invites to school, and I do know that many schools are limiting the number of adults that are allowed in the building. For example, some schools aren't even really letting parents come in unless there's some um, oh. extenuating circumstance. So that's limited yeah. right now, but that should change. Yeah, it, 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 people get more comfortable. Um, it was funny. I went over to um, Kaiser Elementary over on Geyer. Uh, was it two weeks ago to open some discussions with them? We have a whole bunch of first graders coming at the end of the month. Thank you in advance for signing up. Please, please, please. Um, it was funny. Um, Kelly Eschenroder is their office manager. Uh, I've done equations there for more than a decade. We, ha we have a great relationship, which I guess when I went in there, that was literally the first school I had been in in like 16 months. And he said, and she said, yep, you're here. And this is as far as you're going. Uh, <laughs> oh, and okay. yeah, so we had a meeting in the conference room adjacent to the office, but it, for good reason. Um, you know, I don't envy what schools have to deal with here. Um, you know, they're in the middle of a mass war that's going on. Um, they're trying to keep the kids safe, healthy in school, not have outbreaks and such. Um, and so yeah, that's, that's part of the reality that they're dealing with. Um, but, I just um, wanted to express the interest that I have as a volunteer in doing. Yeah, and we've had occasional instances. Um, I think the, the bigger challenge we, we often have with schools is that uh, you know, getting anything happening on the school grounds is a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, because teachers have way overpacked agendas that they need to quote cover. Um, and it's another one of those, we could make a really good argument that coverage is a bad idea, but yeah, teachers have mouths they have to fill at home too. They need their jobs, um, but we'll continue on that. Um, I wouldn't expect a lot of um, being on school this this year. Uh, they're, they're just very cautious, but you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, 
one thing that we've all learned in the last 18 months is hang on next week going to be different. Um, and so we'll, we'll see what comes, but um, I, I'd be, I'd be happy if we're reasonably busy in the spring this fall is going to be slow, but um, we do have important work to do. But, um, but it, it will be a slow fall, certainly. Yes, Steve, you can sign up as well. My cat wants to volunteer. Uh, um, we got a question from Barbara in the chat. Yeah. Um, How do we reach out to getting new schools to come to Litzinger? Um, we're open. A lot of our connections are viral. Um, one school to the next to the next, or one teacher to the next, or a teacher changes schools. Um, Can I chime Leslie, in? Julie, you want yeah. to jump in on that? I was just going to say, if, if you happen to know of a teacher, especially in the upper grades, like third grade on up, including middle school or high school, if you know of any teachers that are interested in using the outdoors, uh, more effectively or more intentionally with their students, um, you are welcome to pass my contact information on to them. Julie's contact information, um, you know, if they feel comfortable giving you their contact information, we are happy to reach out to them as well. We can offer, you know, a one-time visit kind of for them to come out here with their students where um, their students will be out with volunteers and that would give Julie and I uh, time to talk a little bit more with them about our program. So that would be kind of the first step. We don't, we don't have a flyer at this point in time. Usually we get um, those together kind of in the new year as we begin to pre prepare for our summer teacher professional development opportunities. So yeah. I hope uh, that's good info. Yeah. And um... There, there is an opportunity here. It, it's kind of a, a, a weirdly limited opportunity in the sense that we have a lot of calendar space this fall. Um, you know, it's, it's relatively easy to fit people in. The challenge being that um, schools asking to go on field trips, you know, a lot of schools just are not doing field experiences right now. Um, so we're certainly open to them. Um, as Leslie said, happy to have the conversations. We have the calendar space, um, get, we can get them in. Um, side note there, when we get them on the calendar, we need you too uh, to help make those experiences happen. But um, in some ways it is an open year calendar wise because of um, so many schools not doing field experiences. So uh, if you know them, send them along. Um, we're at this point where we're kind of seeing what we can sustain as well. Um, and some of that will be, you know, can, can we um, equip the, the school groups we have? Um, and some of that you'll enable by, you know, with, with volunteering as well. Long answer there. Uh, and we'll be back to normal. Uh, next summer, we'll have the more traditional um, effective outdoor learning workshops that tend to be our main entry point. So we'll, we'll start recruiting for that in the spring when schools catch their breath and get a sense of where the world is as well. I see that Mary Fitzgerald has her hand up. Okay. Right. So um, it's funny you mentioned Kaiser. I live two blocks from there and I was just doing crossing guard <laughs> um, volunteer work there this morning. So I will, I would love to to help you, um, you know, with that group. I know a lot of the folks there. Yeah. My second thing is I've been part of the Green Schools Quest um, for, I guess, seven years now. And I'm just thinking there would be, this is some great opportunities to cross pollinate yeah. with both of your organizations, with the Botanical Garden. Um, Green Schools Quest is a, is a competition between schools for doing a green program and they have um, mentors working with, you know, it could be an art teacher, a science teacher, whoever. And it, it is literally doing what you're talking about is bringing and extending um, a lot of ecology work, a lot of work about recycling, environmental studies to the classroom. So I just would love to talk to you about um, connecting these two groups because yeah. yeah. I think there's some real opportunities to support each other and they've changed their format. Um, I don't know if you've seen two smaller month long projects 
um, because of COVID and it's a little bit more workable and feasible now for a lot of different um, school yeah. groups. Yeah, and I think that that's part of the, particularly for the older kids, that's part of that value proposition of you know, ways to engage. Because um, if you look at the formal curriculum that many schools are accountable for, ecology is this tiny little niche and finding broader ways to attach these. That's um, you know, so some of the citizenship pieces, some of the um, components of the Green Schools Quest. Um, you note from that uh, MIT model, I showed you the graphing and stuff that are they're very common parts of the upper elementary middle school curriculum that give, give toeholds where ecology doesn't do it by itself. Um, but Martha, did you hear that? Mary is signing up for the all five days, the week of the 27th. Well, she has a few steps to take before she can do that. Well, but now, now she's got a reason. Yep. Um, yeah, that, that's, a, um, that's a Monday to Friday, uh, 9.30 to 11. Uh, some really cool first graders there. Other thoughts, questions? And this is the Ask the Director Almost Anything hour. I have a question. Sure. Um, I feel really comfortable working with the K through three yeah. because I feel like I know their curriculum and everything. So yeah. I know that we're trying to extend it. Will there be any extra training for the volunteers yeah, of course, of course, of course. To, work, to work with those groups of kids and what the goals are and how we can yeah. meet them at Litzinger? Yeah, yeah. No, certainly um, those would be good pieces to have. Um, ultimately, the age-wise, they're a bit older. My experience has been that as far as nature, they're all newbies. Um, you know, they, they tend not to have those experiences. So the bodies are a bit bigger, the voices can get a little deeper, but they don't necessarily have that much more experience, but we can certainly um, set up an enrichment, um, particularly when we get into, if we, if we develop programming around some more complex ideas, um, set up some enrichment and support for you. Um, I not you personally, but you know, for, for all of you. Teachers have are different. Sorry? So the goals that the teachers yeah, are, yeah, yeah. Need are different. And I'm wondering yeah. more about how to. Yeah, and I think you, you're, you're, you're honing in on a really important idea there about how, how do we mesh well. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, being, do, being able to do that. Um, but with that, we want to be clear too that, um, you know, continue to sign up for the ones you're comfortable with as well. You know, some of you really prefer younger kids, some of you really prefer older kids, some of you prefer Tuesdays or whatever it is, you know, it's just, you know, and, and that's, that's good. You know, that's what we, we really want you to find the spaces that uh, give meaning to your work. Um, but you, you're raising an important point there that um, as we fluff up our upper grades or re-inflate re our upper grades, um, we, we'll, we'll need to be sure that we're providing the support you need to feel comfortable and succeed. So no, th thanks for raising that. One more question. Yeah, of course. What safety um, protocols or whatever. How are you keeping us safe? How are we keeping the kids safe? Will we be notified if there is a um, a test? I mean, if one of the chil yeah, yeah. children has a positive test, yeah, yeah. will we be notified that we should take care or what? Yeah, the idea, so, um, and that's some of what the, um, the um, re-entry workshops, for lack of a better term, will cover. But in general, the idea is masks, masks, masks. Mm -hmm. um, and so that you're masked, the kids are masked. Virtually none of the kids we work with are going to be vaccinated uh, just because of the population yeah. age that, um, you know, until there's a kid vaccine, that's just not going to happen. Um, but um, if everybody is masked, that's a piece of it. Uh, the tracing, what we're asking the teachers to do is not to do ad hoc groups when they get there, but to know the group so that like, if you go out with a group, uh, we'll be able to connect you with those five kids. And that, you know, that cuts both ways that if they come up with a diagnosis within their group, we wanna be able to attach it to you if, the unfortunate happens and a volunteer um, comes up um, with code, we're gonna be able to trace it back to the ones that you had closer work with as well. Um, so we do have kind of our own 
Uh, aside from the, the idea of masking in general, keeping the distance you can, we know that's hard uh, to, you can't all hover around a log without getting closer somewhat, uh, but masks keeping the distance that we can and an informal contact tracing mechanism um, and all the hand sanitizer that you could possibly want. Can I just chime in just yep. to reiterate a couple things that Bob said? So on the actual lesson plan, if you have, uh, if you are signed up for a visit in the next couple of weeks, you'll see that there is a part of the lesson plan where we are asking the teachers to write, to, to include the, the first names of the kids in each group. And as Bob said, those oh. are predetermined before they come out. So that, and, and then we can make sure we know which one of you led which group, if that makes sense. Um, so that's something that will appear on the lesson plan. So there's a, there's a little bit of difference to the lesson plan that you will see this year and the lesson plan that the teacher sees. Um, as you saw in some of the photos from the visit on Tuesday, um, you know, masks are up, masks are under the nose, Max, masks are around the chin or on the elbow. That's, a, that's just going to be a constant um, reminder for students at school. Uh, what I'm hearing, you know, from my own kids experience and from all of the teachers that I have had contact with is when the kids go outside at school, they do not wear, need to wear masks. So they are wearing them inside the buildings, but when they go outside for, you know, recess or if they're eating outside for lunch or if they're going outside for a part of their class, masks are not required for kids outside. So that's a different thing that we are re re requesting here. Um, you know, it's just an added layer to keep us all safer um, because uh, even though there are ways to try and space ourselves out, I'm sure that you all can think back to your, you know, prior experiences working with kids. Um, it's difficult. It's challenging. It's more challenging to maintain the three foot distance when you're working with a group of kids. So we feel that the masking um, is an added layer of protection. So, uh, but again, because they're not doing it typically when they go outside, uh, we are asking, you know, it, it's just, we're going to have to constantly remind them. And they're yeah. generally very good about it. Um, we are also asking that they wear the masks on the bus. Um, you know, Tabari, our bus driver, or any bus driver we have, that's a different individual that's being added into the mix of that classroom cohort. We are all different people that um, are, don't commonly interact with the group of kids and that teacher. So, you know, remember that they are typically together. That's their cohort, but we are, are new people coming into that. So um, that's kind of a little bit more about masking, probably yeah. more than you wanted to know, but yeah. just a little background. Um, but, and, and with that, don't hesitate to remind them, you know, um, you know, Johnny, remember masks up kind of thing. Um, and we have been trying to take, you know, it was hot on Tuesday afternoon, so we needed to take some mask breaks. We tried to spread out to do that. There are areas where we can do that. Um, I will tell you that this mask, oh my gosh, in the winter time, it's like the best thing. Your face will not get cold again. I'm like gonna continue on with that. And for a burn, for a prairie burn, this works so much better than the bandanas that I used to try and tie and, you know, tie around my head. So there's some pros to it. Uh, Bob, do you yeah. see any role for the volunteers in, in a restoration? Of course, yeah, we have an, uh, um, looking down the list, most of you all are education volunteers, but there's a, a right. large and growing restoration team. They would love to have help with that to starting this week and certainly moving ahead. There's gonna be a lot of work with the uh, post MSD restoration. Who's the? Restoration head. James. Yeah. We, um, yeah. Um, we did a, um, that maybe we should have uh, made that clear. We, we did a little word chart shuffle. Previously, all of the permanent staff reported to me for HR purposes. And we're a small team, we all interact anyway. But for HR purposes, uh, up until about a year ago, um, all of the permanent staff reported to me. We did a reorg, if you will. So the court and restoration team reports to James, who reports to me. Um, so they're in HR language. They are in um, Adam and Allison and Rebecca are indirect reports to me. 
um, direct reports to James and the other permanent staff are still direct to me. And I can just do a little shout out for uh, the enrichment I'll be doing in January, talking about a site plan overview. So just so everybody can kind of get on the same page as uh, oh, that what all staff have uh, kind of seen and been updated with. So. Yeah, and at that point by January, we may have a better handle on where MSD is going. Any other questions, ideas, suggestions? If you have anything you'd rather not share in a public forum, please feel free to give me a call, or drop me a note. Um, but we, again, we really value your commitment and loyalty through a very challenging period um, and want to be sure that Litzinger remains a piece where you continue to grow as a person, find value. So um, don't, don't hesitate to be clear on you know, what, what you'd like to see for Litzinger and um, if we can make it happen, we'll do our best to make it happen. 